Good evening, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to so many of you who've made it here to Emmanuel Church this evening. I'm the Reverend Rich Townend. I am the, uh, the curate here. Um, and just so you know, this is uh, uh, a place where you can drink your drinks in here. When you need to go to the loo, please go whenever you, whenever you want. Um, we're going to have a great evening uh, together. And we, we welcome everybody who's here tonight, including those who are joining us on online uh, through the live stream and uh, the many guests as, as well the many people who've come from further afield um, and it'd be just worth having a bit of a shout out to see where people have come from have we got anyone from beverly in this evening yeah. hey we've got some from a good contingent there have we got anyone from uh scarborough this evening yeah. hey. anyone from nafferton yeah. i spoke to some people from nafferton before one of my favorite place names wet wang Anyone from Wet Wang? Yeah, there is. I took a chance. There is. Uh, anyone from, oh, where else can I say? You, you tell me. Where else have we come from? Leven. Great. Some from Leven. Killam. Anyone else from Killam? Brilliant. A oh, good contingent there. Anyone from York? Well, a very warm welcome to everyone from the diocese has come this evening. Uh, I know that Jenny has come and, and, and Stephen, obviously, and uh, we've got Eleanor, our bishop, here, and Andy, our archdeacon in the East Riding as well, and a few other people, I think, uh, from, from the diocese as well. So a very warm welcome to you as well. Now, this isn't the first time that Archbishop Stephen has been here to Emmanuel Church. One of my highlights of my ministry here has been when we did some baptisms in the sea back in August, and Archbishop Stephen came along to do those uh, with me. And, uh, and I made a bit of a mistake, a rookie error, if you like, then, because um, I guess I felt slightly overawed, really, that, wow, we've got the Archbishop coming, this is really special. And I said, um, a very warm welcome to our very special guest. <laughs> and, um, and Archbishop Stephen, he put me right. Uh, and and he, he, he said that actually he is one of us. We are brothers and sisters together. Whichever church we are from um, this evening, we come together uh, in God's name uh, to worship and to join together as one church. And uh, it was, it was uh, something that was described to me by a member of our congregation as the politest ticking off that he's ever heard. And I, and I thought that, um, actually, no, he was right. You know, we are, we are all one. We're all together. And for that reason, um, when we finish this evening, Stephen, uh, do feel free to, to help out with the clone up. I'm just going to pray for us now. Uh, I'm going to pray, pray with us now, and then we are going to uh, stand up and worship together. So please do bow your heads. <coughs> Father God, we thank you that we can gather together from many different churches, from many different traditions, from many different areas, but we come together in your name with one voice, knowing that we are brothers and sisters together. Father, we thank you for Stephen and for Eleanor and for Andy and for Jenny and for all of the people from the diocese who support the work of our ministries in our churches. We ask, Lord, that we will be envisioned and inspired by what we hear tonight so we may live, leave here this evening with uh, a fresh understanding of your love for us and a new desire to share your word with others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our uh, organist Raymond is going to lead us in worship as we sing together a hymn, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim. Please do stand as we sing together. <laughs>
you so much for welcoming us and for everyone here at Emmanuel for your hospitality um, to us. It's so, so good to be together um, in this sacred place and to dwell together on the gift of Christ given for us and the story that we get to live and to share. Now, there's a, a very important member of our family with us tonight. Um, Wayne Hill, are you here? <laughs> Would you stand up for us? <laughs> It's Wayne's birthday today, everybody, and he's spending it with us as his family. So we're going to embarrass him, and we're going to give him a big round of applause. So happy birthday. Thank you, Wayne. Um, and we also have Archbishop Stephen with us, <laughs> who's also very important in his own way. Um, and we are so thankful. We're, um, yeah, we're so thankful for the way that you love and serve us and deeply pray for us. And we know that you do that every day. And so as you come to share with us, we'd love to pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for all your gifts to us and for the gift of being family together. We thank you for your son, our brother, Archbishop Stephen. We thank you for his deep love for you and for us, and his deep passion that everyone in this earth should know their true identity as your child. And so we pray that you'd bless him as he shares with us tonight, that you'd open our hearts, open our minds afresh, that we would be bearers of your gospel and shine brightly as your lights in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, uh, what a joy to be with you this evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it, it's not my birthday, but ha happy birthday, Wayne. Um, and, and of course, as, as Rich has explained, there are no guests in the kingdom of God. Uh, we are all sisters and brothers in Christ, and new people are not visitors. Uh, they are long-lost family members whom we're welcoming home. So let's start this evening. I mean, I'm hoping it's going to be an enjoyable bit of a roller coaster of an evening. And after I've finished speaking, there'll be a chance for you to chat with each other and then a chance, if you wish, uh, to ask some questions. But let's start with a puzzling bit of scripture. And it's John chapter 14 and verse 22. So. John chapter 14 is uh, those long discourses that you get in John's Gospel. It's the night before Jesus died. Uh, and he's just washed his disciples' feet and now he's speaking to them. And as he speaks, now and again in the narrative, one of the disciples interrupts him with a question. So this is one of those moments uh, John chapter 14, verse 22, Judas, open brackets, not Iscariot, close brackets. <laughs> so you remember there, there are two Judases. So this is not Judas Iscariot, this is the other Judas. Judas, open brackets, not Iscariot, close brackets, said to Jesus, Lord, why is it that you reveal yourself to us but not to the world? It's like a really good question, isn't it? How is it that you reveal yourself to us, but not to others? And isn't this actually, now we come to think of it, isn't this actually the question that we ask so many times? All of us. Often, I, I think, probably, about our family members or closest friends. Lord, why is it, you know, that, that my faith is so real and so strong and, and you've revealed yourself to me? And yes, of course, I have my dark moments and my difficulties, but 
how is it you revealed yourself to me, but not to my husband? Or to my mum, or to my kids? I mean, I'm a dad, I've got three sons. Um, We brought them all up the same way. They all had pretty much the same kind of experience of the church and the Christian faith. And each one of them has responded differently. And I'm very irritated about that. (laughs) And I'm saying to God, how is it, Lord? How is it that that's happened? So, So like my eldest son is full of faith and works in ministry for the church. And my middle son, somehow, we've managed to turn out your bog-standard Anglican. So, I mean, it's quite an achievement, actually, um, in this day and age. So, it's like, if you said to him, do you believe in God, he would say yes. Uh, And what do you feel about the church? Well, not a lot, you know. (laughs) So he'll he'll go Christmas and Easter, and, you know, maybe, maybe Mothering Sunday if he's home, and possibly at harvest, but, but the culture of the church doesn't, just doesn't work for him. And then our youngest son, he's still, he's still wrestling and fighting it all. That, that's, and, it, and I'm sure my story, that experience, is replicated in, in every one of our lives. And, and, and for those of us in, in, in ordained or licensed and authorised ministry. I mean, many of us, we've laboured long and hard. You know, we've poured ourselves into the service of the gospel and we haven't seen the results we hoped for. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's fantastic that we've seen some people come to faith, but there's so many others who haven't. Or, or who started to be on the road and then they, they faded away. And we're saying, Lord, how is it that you reveal yourself to some, but not to others? So that was the question that Judas, open brackets, not Iscariot, close brackets, <laughs> said to Jesus. John, if you don't believe me, look it up. John 14, verse 22. So Jesus' answer it's going to be super helpful, isn't it? Because this is the question we ask. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will keep my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Okay, so I need to be completely honest. Wasn't quite the answer I was hoping for, okay? (laughs) Um, Or or is it? You see, I, I think what this might mean is that Jesus is saying, oh, I do indeed, I do indeed long to be known to everyone. I don't have favour. I don't choose to be revealed to one person and then conceal myself from another. I do, indeed, I long to be known in every human heart and this is how I propose to do it. I propose to do it through you. That in order for this to happen, I will come and make my home in you and with you. And in the power of the Spirit, because as you know when you read these in context, these passages are about the coming and the gifting of the Spirit. That when the Spirit comes, then Jesus is born in us, God makes his home in us, and that through us, God is made known. So I kind of also want to say, or add to that, there is no plan B. That this is how God works. And actually, when you stop to think about it, it's amazing and miraculous. I mean, what's the church? 
I mean, there's many different fancy descriptions of the church. The Bible itself has many different images to describe the church. But I think I'd say this. The church is that bunch of women and men who've been so impacted by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that they have formed a community around him and by his spirit making God's home in them, they are seeking to follow in the way of Jesus and they're trying to change the world. That's what the church is. Uh, and I, I give with one hand, I take with the other. I think that's quite a nice way of thinking about the church. But I think I also need to say to you lot, gathered here this evening, therefore we are here not because we're so holy or we're so clever or we're so eloquent or even we're so faithful. We are here because we're what's available at the moment. <laughs> you know, we are the kind of Keystone Cops, Barmy Army, people of, people of God. That, that we're the ones who have responded to God's call who have invited Jesus to make his home in our hearts, and therefore we are his plan A, his presence, making him known in the communities where we serve. And isn't it amazing, isn't it miraculous, that in our Diocese of York, in pretty much every city, every town, every parish, there is a little bunch of Christians, faithfully, Sunday by Sunday, year by year, living out this vocation to be the presence of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit for that community. Sisters and brothers, I esteem you. I thank you for your faithful witness and service. And I know it's hard at times. And I know sometimes we look around and look at each other and think, is this it, just us? Uh, and we don't have the, the resources or the people we'd long for. Nevertheless, what you do, Sunday by Sunday, year by year, it's amazing. And I thank you for that. Um, the local church is so, so, so important. That's the way God's message is known. And in this diocese... The way we're kind of describing that vocation to invite Jesus to make his home in our hearts so that we can be his presence for the world, so that he can be no made known, what we're calling that is living Christ's story. That, that God, by the Spirit, invites each one of us to be part of God's story, making Jesus known in our communities. And, and thank you for being part of that and particularly thank you to the leadership in each church where there is so much that is to be done. And under that big title, Living Christ Story, we have identified four priorities which I'll very quickly describe to you. Priority number one, that we might all seek to become more like Christ by inviting the Spirit to bring more of Jesus to us. Somebody put it to me this way a few years ago. It, it's not that we need more of the Spirit. The Spirit needs more of us. We, we need to give ourselves. So, like, do you know that story? It's a great story. I think it might even be true. Um, the great story of um, the medieval English knights who when they were baptised in the sea, like I was doing baptisms here in the sea in Bridlington in August, what a glorious day that was. Um, when they were baptised in the sea, when they went down into the waters to be baptised, they held their right arms out of the water. And the reason they held their right arms out of the water is because that's the hand in which they hold their sword. So they were kind of saying to God, yes, Lord, I submit to you, I want to be baptised, but I'm going to keep this bit to myself, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and we each need to ask ourselves the question, what are we, as it were, holding out of the waters of baptism? What things are we keeping for ourselves? How can we recommit ourselves 
to the Lord's purposes for our lives and for the world. And uh, there's something coming to help us with that uh, very, very shortly. Uh, in the diocese, we're producing a resource which we're calling a rhythm of life. It's a resource to help us grow and develop our own spiritual lives every day. It can be used by individuals, it can be used by groups, there's going to be a, a, some, some videos, a booklet. It's all going to come out in Lent, but it's not just for Lent. Uh, you can use it at any time uh, during the coming year or years. Watch this space. The second priority is to reach people who do not yet know Christ. Of course, that has to be a priority for the church. And in this diocese, I'm really proud of the things that we are seeking to do through mustard seed and through multiply, through our church schools and in other initiatives. There's some great things happening. We need to build on those and, of course, we need more. Thirdly, we want to grow churches of missionary disciples where every single one of us, because of our baptism into Christ, recognise that we have a part to play in God's mission of love to the world. That every one of us is a disciple. Every one of us has a ministry. Ministry isn't something that just belongs to certain people with certain titles. It belongs to all of us because we are baptised into Christ. Because we have received the Spirit. And each of us, according to our different gifts, talents, passions, circumstances, each of us has that part to play. I, I want every church in this diocese to be a school for disciples. Somewhere where we can come and learn what does it mean for me, for us, to be followers of Jesus here, in and for this community. And we want to be younger. Um, uh, well, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, we, we have to recognise um, a priority for the, for the, for the young. Um, we have to work with children and young people, schools, families, and treasure and honour them. Uh, and that must be an important part of our work. And also more diverse so that we look like the communities we serve and so that everyone knows that they are welcome in the house of God. And fourthly, the fourth one, is about transforming our structures and finances so that the way we order the life of the church and use the resources that we do have align with and best support the work of the church in the front line which is us, you, in your parishes, in your local churches. And here I do want to say a very big thank you for the work that's been done in the formation of deanery plans over the last year. We've now collected all those together. We are doing some work on them, and we believe that from that uh, we will be better able to resource the local church and be realistic about the resources we have as well as the resources we don't have and align them uh, to the very best effect. But this evening is really about the big picture of living Christ's story and I simply want to spend the rest of the time I've got thinking about those three words and in so doing telling you a little bit about myself and my own journey of faith. And I want to start in the middle with the word Christ. Um, somebody put it to me this way recently. The only interesting thing about the church is God. That's, that's the reason we exist. It's because of God and because of what God has shown us and done for us in Jesus Christ. We are the Jesus people, the Jesus movement, in the power of the Spirit. That's, that's the only really interesting thing about us. Um, but I wasn't brought up going to church. So there was no Christian faith in my uh, formative years as a child. I must have gone to church once because I was baptised. Uh, my parents 
were part of what you might call the great post-war lapsed generation. So they got married in the late 1950s, uh, started a family. They both went to church. In fact, they met at a church youth club. So they both went to church. They, they didn't reject the Christian faith. They just got out the habit, like many, many people of that generation did. It was a time of huge cultural change. Um, but as I say, I was, there was enough religion left inside them to think that me and my brothers and my sisters should be baptised, so I must have gone once. And uh, well, I'll just tell you a bit of a funny story about that. So, so before I was Archbishop of York, I was Bishop of Chelmsford, which is Essex and East London, which is also where I was born. Um, and so when I became the bishop there, they made this little film which could be shown in the churches and put on the website to introduce the new... But we did something similar here in York two years ago. Um, so I thought, as I was... This was where I was from, and this was where I was baptised, I thought, wouldn't it be good if we made the film in the church where I was baptised and I was filmed standing by the font? So I was able to say, even though I wasn't brought up as a Christian and discovered faith later in life, this is kind of where it began. I was baptised in this font. Anyway, my mum saw the film and said to me, that wasn't where you were baptised. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, I was, I was. I said, St Barnabas Hadley, that's what it says on the, on the certificate. She goes, no, 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 you weren't baptised there, she said. When you were baptised, they hadn't finished building the church. <laughs> she said, you were baptised in, in the parish hall with, I don't know, like, like a pate bowl for the font. <laughs> um, anyway. So my, my upbringing uh, for those first years, th there was no Christian faith. But I believed in God, which I think, we've got some experts on children's schools here, it's, it's quite common, isn't it? Yeah. This is quite common. This is our wonderful, wonderful, I never know what people's titles are, children's officer, children and youth advisor. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, I felt, I've discovered it's quite common that, in fact, most children believe, even though they may not go to church, but they, it's, like, it's like it's inbuilt this sense of God. And I, I remember having that. I remember believing in God, but I didn't know what to do with it. Um, it had no form. So that was inside me, and I think, therefore, I was kind of interested in wanting to find out more. But my first real exposure to the Christian story came through some of you who are my age or above. I know that's not most of you, you're far younger, but some of you may remember this was in the 1970s, there was a se serialisation on television of the life of Jesus, Zeffirelli's Jesus of Nazareth, Robert Powell played Jesus, some of you haven't seen, there's at least, there's at least two or three nodding heads, um, so some of you remember it. So that was my first exposure to the story, I must have known a bit about the story, but basically I'd never come across it. Um, and for me, it was absolutely riveting. Um, and in those days, remember those, remember those days when in your home you only had one television set um, and the television set only had two or three channels. Um, families used to watch the television together. We, were, we weren't a church-going family, but in, in, in every other way we were a very traditional family. And, um, you know, after tea on Sunday we'd sit down and we'd watch things on the television. And so we all sat down to watch this. And I just... I just found it incredible. And when it came to the final episode, I think it's three or four episodes, the final episode obviously dealing with the death and resurrection of Jesus. I mean, it just completely... I, I, I don't really know what words to use to describe it. It, it blew me away. It, it kind of completely churned me up. And as I sat there watching it, I started to weep. And, and I, I didn't know why. I didn't really know where these tears were coming from. I, I just was so impacted by 
this person, Jesus, and by this story. But I was a teenager with my mum and dad there, my two brothers, my sister. It was embarrassing to be sitting there weeping in front of them. And in every other situation like that, I'd have sort of left the room. But I couldn't leave the room. I was so... Yeah, completely taken with this story. And also, I know this sounds weird, I I needed to find out what happened next. I didn't really know the ending. Anyway, when it did end, and I'm sitting there, weeping, confused, uh, I, I then do leave the room. I go up to my bedroom. I can remember still lying on my bed, and I was just sobbing uncontrollably. I don't know why. And after about 10 minutes, uh, my mum comes into the bedroom. She pokes her head round the door. She means it nicely. And she says to me, oh, you know, come on, Stephen. Pull yourself together. Well, here I am in Bridlington on the 1st of February, 50 years later. And I have to say to you, I couldn't pull myself together then and I have not been able to pull myself together since. (laughs) To discover the beauty of the gospel and the story of Christ has turned my life upside down. This is not the life I had planned. But, I mean, do you know that bit in, do you know that bit at the end of John chapter 6? I I love that bit at the end of John chapter 6, where we've had the feeding of the 5,000. They've all come back the next day. They want more bread, but Jesus doesn't give them any bread the next day. He says, I am the bread. Bit disappointing. They all leave. Um, And right at the end of John chapter 6, Jesus is alone with his disciples, and he says to them, it's such a sad bit of the story, he says to his disciples, I suppose you're going to go as well. And at that point, Peter steps forward. And Peter says to Jesus, where else can we go? Which I kind of take it to me, if there is an exit, show me the exit. You know, this isn't easy. But then, you have the words of eternal life. And and, and that is my story. And I guess it's your story as well. We all have different experiences of how faith became real for us. But but there comes a point for all of us where you're standing there going, where else can we go? What we've seen in this Jesus is so powerful, so beautiful, so compelling, that there is nowhere else to go. He has the words of eternal life. He is the one we must follow. He is the one upon whom we must centre our lives. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, the one who shares our life on earth in order that we can share his life in glory. Christian faith isn't complicated. It's actually very simple. He came down to earth so that we can go up to heaven. He came to share our life so we can share his life. Oh, yeah, hard to live out, demanding, demanding, costly. But there's, you know, you wouldn't be here this evening. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You wouldn't be here unless you found yourself in that same place. Where else can we go? That's what happened to me watching the telly on a Sunday evening. You know, God will use anything and everything to to get through. I didn't start going to church the next day, by the way. Uh, There's a lot more to my story, but that was a turning point where suddenly this Jesus became real. So let's now turn to the first word, living Christ's story. And here I want to say, the best advertisement for the Christian faith is a Christian life. And that God calls each one of us To be a sign, an advertisement, uh, as Paul uses the image, a letter, a letter written, not on tablets of stone, 
but on the tablets of our, of our living hearts, written by the Spirit. We are called to live out our faith each day. And the faith that we celebrate on Sundays is to be lived out and shared on Mondays and Tuesdays and, and all through the week. And yes, of course I care about what the church does on Sundays, but I want you to know I care more about what the church does on Mondays. Because on Mondays we're still the church, but whereas we are gathered together on Sundays, on Mondays we are sent out to our homes, our places of work, our communities, and it is there that we are called to live and share Christ's story. That's why this Rhythm of Life resource is going to help all of us to work out, so what might that mean for me? How can I strengthen and develop my life as a Christian in my home, my family? my place of work, my school, my community. And within the church, we need to value and honour the witness and ministry of every Christian person. So some years ago, I was leading a mission in, uh, in Barnsley at St Helens Athersley, a fabulous church on really quite a deprived estate uh, on the edge of Barnsley. And... Um, the Bishop of Pontefract, who was the local bishop, was coming to commission the mission team. Now, the then Bishop of Pontefract, Richard Hare, some of you may remember him, was quite a character. Um, he, uh, there was a conference, an international conference on charismatic renewal and Pentecostalism, and the Church of England had to send a bishop to it, and Richard Hare got sent because he was considered to be a nice, safe pair of hands. <laughs> Level-headed, not going to be too taken in by some of these charismatic goings-on. So Bishop of Pontefract was sent. Would you believe it? He gets zapped by the Holy Spirit at the conference. <laughs> he comes back swinging from the chandeliers, <laughs> sewing butterflies onto his vestments. Um, and... Uh, and was, and was thereafter known affectionately as Penty Ponty. <laughs> so he comes, he comes to commission the mission team, which was quite something, because at the beginning of the service, um, he, he, he turns to the, to the parish priest and says to the parish priest, uh, now that he says, what time are you hearing confessions tomorrow? <laughs> The poor vicar was a bit taken aback, not expecting this question, and sort of mumbled some reply. And then the bishop turned to the congregation and he said, I'll tell you this. He said, there's only one thing that's going to get in the way of this mission. And that is unrepented sin. Um, again, sorry to spoil the party, but, you know, we are all sinners in need of grace. You know, we can only pour out that which God pours in. And we always constantly have to make room for God by being honest about ourselves and our need of God. You know, somebody put it to me this way recently, uh, complaining about the church. Somebody said to me, you know, the church, it's full of hypocrites. I replied, yes. And there's room for one more. <laughs> I said, come and join us. <laughs> you know, but, that, but that is the point. We don't pretend. You know, we're not, I'm not a Christian because I'm so good. No. I mean, that's the great English heresy that we think somehow being a Christian equals being good. Well, I mean, obviously, I hope you're good. I try to be good. But that isn't the point. I'm a Christian not because I'm so good. I'm a Christian because I know my need of God. I know I get it wrong. I know I can't do it on my own. Blessed are the poor in spirit, says Jesus. Blessed are those who are not self-sufficient. Blessed are those who don't think they've got it all worked out. Blessed are those who know they need God. Um, and so, yes, he put it rather dramatically, but he was right. You know, it's like those nuts holding their... What are we holding out of the water? What else do we need to do so that God can break through into our lives, into our hearts?
so that we can live Christ's story. Anyway, we're back in the vestry. The mission service is about to begin. The vicar says to the bishop, he introduces him to Fred, the head server. He says, Bishop, can I introduce Fred? Fred is our head server. Um, what the bishop didn't know, but I discovered, is that Fred was, as well as being the head server in church on Sundays, he was Monday to Friday the deputy head teacher at a Church of England comprehensive school that served that estate. So I'm thinking to myself, when God looks at Fred, and when God rejoices in Fred and Fred's ministry, what is God? You know, if God was introducing Fred to the bishop, I think God would say, Bishop, this is Fred. Fred works day in, day out, serving this community through this local school. He does amazing work. But no, we're now in the world of the church. Leave your daily life at the door. Um, uh, this is Fred the head server. Don't misunderstand me. We need people to do stuff in church, okay? We need people to serve and to clean and to make the coffee and, yeah, I know I've got the broom there. You know, we need all that. We need that. But most of all, we need to realise that we are called to live Christ's story in our daily lives. And when we become witnesses to Jesus in our daily lives, not because of our goodness or our strength or our wisdom, but because we've invited Jesus in, then I believe we will see the church grow. We will see people come to faith in Christ. We will build God's kingdom in the world. And finally, it is a story, living Christ's story. Um, and it's a story which is to be continued, to be continued in your life, to be continued in my life, to be continued in your church, in your parish. God is always wanting to do new things. The Christian faith is a story before it's a statement. The Christian faith isn't a manifesto, it's a man, the person. Jesus Christ. It's not a list of things to believe in or it's a relationship. A, a living, breathing story. And the, the evangelical uh, theologian Ian Paul put it beautifully in a book of his I read recently. He says, the scriptures are not simply a story about what God did in the past. In Christ. They now become our story. And another theologian, Peter Adams, wrote, we are part of the biblical people of God. We are their contemporaries. They are our friends, our examples, our warnings, our encouragements. So let me finish where I started. Um, Jesus, on the night before he died speaking to his friends uh, in St John's Gospel. And as you may know, in chapter 15 and the following chapter, Jesus uses the imagery of the vine and the branches. And he says, cut off from me, you can do nothing. And that we need to invite God to abide in us. Well, anyway, there's a, there's a priest who is preaching on this text, John 15, verses 1 to 5. And he's preaching his heart out on this text. Uh, and there's a little boy in the congregation who's, who's listening intently, but doesn't really get the sermon. So after the service, the little boy goes up to the priest and says to the priest, I didn't understand your sermon. Oh, says the priest, what was it about the sermon that you didn't understand. And the little boy says, well, he said, I, I thought you were saying that we need to invite God, invite Jesus, to make his home in our hearts. And the priest said, well, you, you did understand the sermon. That's exactly what I was saying. Oh, well, says the little boy, my problem is this. God is so big. 
and I am so small. If God came and made his home in my heart, wouldn't he burst out all over the place? <laughs> yes, said the priest. That's how it works. Amen. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> I heard him last week in Hull. <laughs> I think you're better tonight. Actually, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, seriously, thank you, Stephen. I mean, you talk about encouragement, and, and it's encouraged me, seriously, a second time to hear it all. Uh, it's just really good to hear you, to hear your faith, to hear your love of the Lord, and just the way it comes across. So what we're going to do is have... Oh, we've probably got ten minutes or so to natter together just where we're sitting. First of all, just what's encouraged you? Let's tonight just share what's encouraged us as we've heard Stephen speak. So what's encouraged you? And as you chair your encouragements, if there are questions that you think I'd quite like to ask, then maybe just identify them, because we're going to have about half an hour or so when we can ask you any questions we like. So uh, ten minutes or so, natter to each other. What's encouraged you? And is there a question you'd really like to ask? Over to you.
and uh, ask you to stop your your conversations. Sounds like you found something to talk about anyway, which is good. Um, we've got about half an hour or so, and uh, he says he's up for any questions. So, uh, Jenny has a microphone, and she's going to run around. She's counting her steps, so we'll get to every corner. So we've got a hand there, and then there's a hand... Oh, there's hands everywhere. So there's a hand there, and then there's a hand there, and then there's a hand there. That's three. Oh, and can you say who you are and where you're from? All right. My name's Simon James. I'm a, a congregation member here, but uh, I was born in the Garden of England, which is uh, Folkestone, so I'm a stranger in in York, but um, they've made me very welcome here, so um, <clears throat> my question is, um, we've, got two, we've got two children, and one of our strategies is that now and next, so you do this, and then you get this, and it actually gives them hope, as well as a behaviour strategy, rather than put them on the naughty step all the time. So <clears throat> my question is, um, what are you doing for the diocese, what plans do you have now, and what are you going to do next? For the diocese and the country and the world. <laughs> and you've got 25 minutes, so I will do you. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll focus on the diocese. I'll say a little bit about the national picture. So, so for the diocese, um, I think if, if we can all get hold of the living Christ story vision, which is only, you know, there's nothing new about it, is it? It's only just another way of saying what Christians have always believed. Well, why not? Yeah. Oh. Is that, is that yeah, it's only another way of saying what we've always said. Um, so, so the now thing is, I think, to get hold of the, the living Christ story agenda and priorities and see what they mean for us as individuals and communities. The, the what next, um, I think, is well, three things immediately spring to mind. First is, uh, we did we surveyed all the parishes and deaneries last year, or whenever it was, uh, and basically one of our questions was, where do you need some help? The overwhelming response was, children, families, young people. Um, now we don't, you know, I, want to be, I need to be honest with you, we've got lots of ideas, but we don't have a lot of resource. Um, but in the National Church, there are resources available which we've been good at uh, accessing for other things. And so that is something we will be looking into. And I mean, I mentioned earlier, Caroline Edwards is here, our wonderful children youth officer. And so with her help, we'll be looking at that. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is... But we have this uh, idea about wanting to revitalise parishes, parishes that are struggling a bit, which of course is many of our parishes. Um, now, we, we would, of course, we want to revitalise every parish, but we've got limited resources, and again, we have access to some national resources. So, what we're going to be doing over the next, over this year, is identifying some parishes where we think. With, with the help of the deaneries, that is. This won't be imposed. But with the help of the deaneries, identify, are there some parishes where maybe just with a bit of extra help and a bit of extra resource, that parish could really start to flourish and fly? And if that works, then we'll move on to a next batch of parishes and, and the next batch, batch of parishes. Um, so that, that's the second thing. And then the third thing is to build on... Um, you know, we've learnt a lot through Mustard's... And our learning a lot through mustard seed and multiply. Um, and we've so, so we've kind of created these learning communities. There's a stepping up group here this evening. Um, so we need to build on that and try to spread that out across the diocese into, into other places where at the moment they've not had the benefit or the opportunity of those things. In terms of the national church, what we're doing in the diocese does align with the national church. Um, that the national vision for the Church of England is that we will be a Christ-centred, Jesus Christ-shaped church with similar priorities to our own. Um, in terms of the life of our nation, 
it's a big question. So, so let me just simply put it like this. So I, I don't know what you think. Well, well let's, let's bring in the world as well. I don't know what you think when you look at the world. But when I look at the world, what I see is division, confusion, sorrow. And, and then I look at what we've been given in Christ. And, and you know, I, I am a simple soul. I believe that what we... So another way of thinking about Jesus is this. Jesus shows us how to be human. So Jesus says, this, this is what humanity is meant to be like. And so I think, well, the, the more that we can make Jesus our model for humanity, the more that we will deal with the problems of the world. And, and, and that's what I consider my work, our work to be. It, it's not about building the earth and the empire of the church. It's about building God's kingdom in the world. Thank you. There's no. obviously a lot more that could be said in that. <laughs> I think, Jenny, there's another question there, and then I think there's somebody at the back over there, and then we'll start looking at other corners of the building. Hello there. My name's Carl Medlock. I'm church warden at St. Lawrence at Sigglesthorne. Uh, we've heard about Multiply, and I believe it to be solely in the towns. I'm probably wrong, but we've never heard of it in our parishes. Can you explain what Multiply is and how we can get benefit from it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, in a moment, I am going to hand over to Andy because he's a dear colleague and he knows much more about this than I do. Um, but what I'll say briefly is uh, Multiply is a new initiative that started a few years ago in the diocese with funding from the National Church. So a, a body called the Church Commissioners look after the, the national assets of the church and they make grants to dioceses, uh, particularly for, for low-income communities, where we're, we're able to maintain a presence in low-income communities because of that money that we receive, but also what they call strategic development money to enable us to try new things, which, frankly, we just don't have the resources to, to, to do ourselves. So we got some money for the Multiply, which is aimed at younger adults, 20s to 40s I think is, is the age group um, and most of it has been spent in towns but not all of it, it's been, we've also looked at market towns with a sort of rural fringe but at this point I'm at the far reaches of my sensible knowledge of this without putting my foot in it so Andy tell us a bit more about Multiply Okay, so the, the, the notion of Multiply is that we want to reach younger adults uh, many of whom have children, but not all, of course. And as Stephen was saying earlier when he talked about his own children, the reality is that for many, stepping from where they are now into a Sunday morning church context is a massive step. And so actually one of those underpinning things about Multiply is to say, can we build communities of people on a journey of faith that may not look like Sunday morning? <coughs> But there'll be, there'll be communities of disciples and they'll be real for their community where they are. Some of them may end up being on a Sunday morning, but many of them may not. And through the funding of full-time people, but also through a number of part-time people as well, we've been able to begin to experiment with that in a number of places across the diocese. Now, it is true that most of the full-time people have been in urban contexts. That was partly because of some of the conditions that were put on us. Um, but we have deliberately put them some in market towns to see can we influence the villages around. But some of the part-time people are in villages. Um, what we always dreamt of, and it is still my dream, is that we would see a ripple effect as people began to see good practice in lots of places and that people would begin to create these new worshipping communities without needing money or a full-time person. COVID has really slowed that down. We began to see the ripple happen. COVID came and it was really hard and I think churches are still quite tired and we're beginning to get back up and moving, aren't we? But trying to work that out. So my aspiration is, and I was very involved in the, in the thinking around Multiply, is that, that, you know, maybe every benefice would have some form of new worshipping community. Realistically, in lots of little villages, it might be too much to expect every little village 
But that age group will happily travel. I've got grandchildren. My daughter takes my granddaughter all over the place for different activities to get to the right place for what she wants for her daughter. And so actually, I think within a rural benefice, there may be something in one village, people will happily travel in. So that's just a quick snapshot on it. It is happening in villages. We long to see that ripple happen more and more in more and more places. And just on the back of that, I'd, thank you, Andy. On the back of that, I'd add, you know, generally speaking, we want to encourage churches to try new things. Um, we want to be permissive about saying, if you've got an idea, we want to back you. Um, we want to hear about it, and if it goes well, we really want to learn from it, because there may be other churches uh, where it's relevant for them as well. But thank you for the question. There was somebody at the back, no, Jenny, I think it was a question at the back there, the gentleman with his glasses, that's the one standing up, perfect. Uh, my name's Ian, I'm from Hutton Cranswick, near Beverley, near Driffield. Um, I want to ask you a question about the 99 and the 1. Because um, where we are, we haven't got 99 sheep that uh, lie safely while a pastor goes out looking for one. We are the 1% of our population that actually comes to church. And yet the church seems to be relying on that 1% to go out looking for the other sheep while we get fewer and fewer shepherds. We need more. We need more pastors because we know that pastors with a vision, energy, people like you, will bring people back to church and please Will the church think about what it spends its resources on and, and think about having the faith to invest in the people that will lead us to be a good, good sheep? Yeah, th thank you. Well, um, I, I entirely agree with you. Um, and, and I honestly believe that is what we're doing. I'm not saying we couldn't do it better or more efficiently, but that is what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, the vast majority of the money that we spent on frontline ministry in parishes, and the money that isn't spent on frontline ministry in parishes is spent either on the essential things that we need for those clergy and parishes to exist. So to give you an obvious example, you know, if you have a vicar who lives in the vicarage, and if you've got you know, a couple of hundred vicarages, more than that, across the diocese, then actually you do need somebody to look after those buildings, and it's cost-effective to do that collectively rather than for each parish to do it. So therefore, we have a little housing department. Um, we all, you know, so there's some, so some essential things that it's actually cost-effective to enable there to be frontline ministers or training. Training for new ministers costs money. Um, so I, I know sometimes there's things said about the money that's spent at the centre, but I think if you actually look at what's spent, you'll see it's either the essential things that without them you wouldn't have any vicars, or it's um, things that we simply have to do, mandatory things, like, like, for instance, safeguarding. And we're all very well aware of the failings of the church and other institutions in safeguarding. And we do spend quite a bit of money each year on safeguarding, but my strong, strong, not my view, my conviction is if we didn't do that, um, then the church would be potentially in a very, very dangerous place. Um, and thirdly, we spend it on the priorities that we, the diocese, agree. Um, so the diocese has said, we want help with children and young people. We can't do that on our own. What we try to get is resourcing from the national church to pay for that, and we're quite good at that. Um, but sometimes we do spend some of our own money on that. But on the whole, that's what the parishes are asking for. So... Um, I can simply give you my assurance that I personally and my colleagues, it is our desire and our determination that money goes to frontline ministry and everything, every other penny that is spent is spent in order to really support and enable that frontline ministry to be effective. Sometimes you'll read other things suggesting otherwise. I think if you actually looked at the balance sheet and the annual accounts of the diocese, you would see that what I'm saying um, is true. We've got uh, Jenny's raising a hand. There's a uh, question online, I think. Got a question on well done. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've had a question coming from Maria, who says she's just up the road at home with kids. Um, 
And she would love to know how you came to know and to realize what God's plan is for you and your life, such as being ordained. Oh, well, thank you, Maria. Um, uh, if you're still watching, you know, I think there's... Um, is it, is it that there may be something good on the telly? She may have turned over on something else by now. Um, so, so I, I, I kind of think I'm a bit of an all-or-nothing person. So not, not quite when I was sitting there watching Zephyrella's Jesus of Nazareth, but not long after that, I think I did know deep inside me that this is what I'd end up doing. But I didn't tell anybody. Um, I'm also... Full, full confession. I'm also the only person I know. So in the Church of England, we have this selection process for ordination. I'm the only person I know who, when they went through the selection process, didn't really go to church at the time. Um, <laughs> which is kind of true. To, to, today, today we're, we've got such a good system, uh, they'd find me out. But back in those days, it was all a little bit more ad hoc. I never lied about it. People just assumed he must go to church. Um, so they never actually asked me. And of course I did go occasionally, of course I did. But as quite a young man, I just had an inner conviction that God was calling me. I, to be honest, I found church a bit difficult. Still do, but I found church a bit difficult. Um, you know, I, I love the church. Don't misunderstand me. I love it, but it's not always easy. Um, hey, I'm the Archbishop of York now, so I mean, I'm lumbered with it. But, um, uh, <laughs> but um, so, so, the, so this is this is a this is a rambling way, of, Maria, of saying I don't really know the answer to the question. Um, there was just a powerful sense of inner conviction that this is, this was what I was meant to do with my life, and and I didn't I couldn't do anything else. Um, but I kept it secret for a, a quite a number of years. And then it actually, the turning point for me was I was going for a, a, a job interview. Um, and I was literally at the place for the interview, about to knock on the door. And I stood there with a powerful sense, this isn't what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I just turned around, you know, got on the train, went to see one of the handful of priests I did know went and just knocked on his door out of the blue and said I think God's calling me to be a priest what do I do? Thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think that's it. Right, we've got, uh, we've got a question here on the left, Jenny. Thank you. Front half, you've been a bit quiet to be honest with the questions. A bit disappointing. Oh, one, one at the front, one you at know, the front. We'll come to you in a moment. Come yeah. to you in a moment then. people in the parishes, in the deaneries. But how can you justify all the money that the Archbishop of Canterbury has set aside for this repayment of slavery debts or whatever, when there are churches that need roofs, there are churches that need heating systems? Yeah. So it's a really good question. Um, first of all, it's, it's not just to be fair to the Archbishop of Canterbury, it's not money that he set aside. Um, <laughs> This is, the money, this is the money that I was referring to earlier, the money that is kept by the church commissioners, uh, which is a charitable fund, um, which is independent of the church, as charitable funds need to be, but its sole charitable purpose is to support the work of the Church of England, and it was the trustees who made this decision, of which I am one and the Archbishop of Canterbury is one, but it's not a decision made by him. What I would say is this, and this is perhaps a hard thing to say, but it probably hasn't been communicated very well. Last year, was it later? Last year, um, the church commissioners audited their accounts, for, or their historic accounts. When they did that audit, we discovered that one billion pounds of our collective assets, one billion pounds, very clearly came from slavery. One billion pounds came from slavery. Because the church and people who gave to the church in that period of history were very invested in, in the slave trade. 
That means that when I get my stipend, any other clergy here, when you get your stipend, that means that something like 5 10% of what you're getting each month, that's where that money came from. Now, I don't suppose any of us are proud of that fact. Um, uh, and therefore, I support the decision the church commissioners have made to put aside a relatively, I know it sounds a huge sum, but it's actually compared with the money we've received and been using and spending and investing for a couple of hundred years. It's a relatively small amount, which is going to be spent in the church. So it's not being spent on somebody else. It's being spent that we might have a better future um, by investing in helping to understand um, racism and racial justice in the church and for the world, or for our nation. And I believe if we do that and get that right, it will benefit our parishes um, because it will do good and it will be the church doing good in a way that no other, I mean lots and lots of institutions in this country have also benefited from slavery. But nobody uh, so far has done what the church has done and said, held up our hands and said, we, we want to be honest with you and say, this is where this money comes from and we know it comes from it. And I have to say some of the letters I've read um, from slaves who, 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 knowing that this was paid for and the church was benefiting, there's letters on, on the archive to the then Archbishop of Canterbury and to York, slaves begging for the church to change its way, which of course we did. So it is a difficult question, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm really glad you asked it, really. And, and, and it wasn't explained. No, no, it's often, all these things are often not explained well, but, but you're right, we could spend that money, you know, that money could be spent on other, you know, there's loads of needs, it could be, but it was felt, when we looked at this, it felt we, we need to do something and set a good example here, and, and I think, well... It's always, it's always right to do what's right, isn't it? And it feels to me this is the right thing to do. And when you do the right thing, actually, that changes the narrative. And I think people will now look at the church and say, oh, they've, they've done the right thing. Therefore, they will feel better disposed towards the church, therefore more likely to come to church, and therefore, in the long run, I think we benefit. Thank you. But thank you for asking. And I'm... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a sobering thing to discuss, but it's, it's part of our difficult history. But as Christians, you know, we, where possible, we have to make amends for our history. It's a great range of questions. Thank you so much. Now, did someone, the, the microphone's at the back, but I think there's a question at the front. Come on, Jenny. <laughs> All your steps. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm Jim from St. James and Holy Trinity in Scarborough. Uh, we have quite a few social groups that use our church hall, and uh, mums and tots group especially. It's really big, and there's a lot of families there, and my own family goes there. And I think we're the only ones that actually go to church on a Sunday and engage with, with the church to that degree. Do you have any advice or good resources for evangelising that group of people? Yes. Um, so speak to Carolyn afterwards. Is the, is, the, <laughs> is the first? She's here. She may be dashing off because the, the big Bible story toddler resource. The big Bible. Thank you. The big Bible story toddler resource is one resource. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. All, what I would say is. Well, perhaps I should add or go, go at a slight angle to the question, because it's a question that I'm sure all of us have a version of that question. So I think in life, it's always good to put your problems into two piles. Um, and one of the piles for your problems, you should label, this is a nice problem to have. Um, and, and I think this is definitely a nice problem to have. Fantastic. You've got some parents and toddlers meeting in your church and you're not quite sure how to evangelise them. What a great problem. I wish every church in the diocese had that problem. Um, 
uh, that, that we've made contact with a group of people, we've befriended them, we're serving them, they're participating in the wider life of the church, and now we have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. That's fantastic. Um, uh, but yes, we need help, and your question illustrates the fact that we need help, and that's why, that's why some of the resources, going back to the gentleman's earlier question, that's why some of the resources at the centre are there to help those situations so that parish can grow. Um, uh, and we want to do more of that when, when and if we can. But for more detailed help, see my dear colleague. And do, and for all of you, I'd say this, for all of you, you know, the, 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 those of us who work for the diocese, what, what's the diocese? The diocese is the parishes, isn't it? It's, it's just the, the sum total of all the parishes. So, you know... It, Let's get rid of all this them and us, you know, stuff. We, we are the people of God in this place working together for the same purpose. Um, and there's people who can help you. Phone us up, write to us. We, we want to help. Still got time for one or two more. Anyone else got a question? Oh, we've got to run you to the back again. <laughs> Sanderson, I'm an RPA at Hutton Cranswick Church. Um, about 30, 20, 30 years ago, I read the book Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. And I'm really glad this lady asked the question about slavery because my worry is that in 100, 150 years' time, people will look back at us and say, The church was rich, they had all these buildings, they spent lots of money on them, while every three seconds in Africa, a child is dying of hunger. And we know how to cure that. I know with um, COVID, it took a while to work that out. But with hunger, we've known how to cure that for hundreds of years, and it's still happening. And that's my worry, that they'll look back at us now and do exactly what we're saying about the slavery, because to me, it's just as bad. Yeah, f f thank you very much. I, 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 I don't think I have anything to, to add that, um, you know, our, our faith is not just for ourselves, it's for the world, and the faith we've, be, we've received is to be lived for the world, um, we are a world church um, and we need to take account of what we're doing to the planet and the, the, the poverty that there is across the world. Thank you. Time for one final question. If not, I've got one. Right, in, right over the, the back there, Jenny, in the we corner. Haven't, we haven't had any about football yet. <laughs> I find that what we're all trying to get over to us all is that we have to have the love of God coming from our own hearts to affect others. Now, I believe what you're trying to get the message across is down to us all to give that love of Christ by being a friend, being there for their needs and helping them, not worrying about our own problems but looking after other people's problems if we can yeah thank you very much I've got nothing to add you've put it beautifully so we're, we're drawing to a close and sometimes there's an elephant in the room and I, I want to ask a question if that's right yeah which I think is sort of elephant shaped question which is that the <laughs> Because I, I suspect there are people here that might want to ask this question. I'm not quite sure how to, to word it. But obviously the church has got some big decisions in the next week or so when Synod meets and we've been reflecting on living in love and faith. Is there anything that you would want to say to us, uh, given I suspect there's loads of different views on that in the room, as we prepare as a church for the Synod meeting next week? Yeah, yeah very happy to, to say a few words about that. Um, just in case some of you don't know what's being referred to, um, over the past five, six, seven years, there's been a process in the Church of England called Living in Love and Faith, in which we've been asking ourselves a question. Uh, and the question is, what's the appropriate way of welcoming uh, LGBTIQ plus people, lesbian and gay people? What, what's the appropriate way of welcoming them into the church? Now, there's, there's no question, 
You know, it's the Church of Jesus Christ. Everybody is welcome. That, that's, not, that's not in dispute. There's, there's nobody who, who, who thinks people shouldn't be made welcome. But there's disagreement on what's the appropriate... How, what does that welcome look like? There's disagreement on that. And it's always painful, isn't it, in a family. We're a family. It's painful when there's disagreement. So the first thing I want to say is, even if we disagree, because we're family... You don't stop loving each other. And that's probably the most important thing to say. We don't stop loving each other. Nor, of course, in Christ are we given a choice about that. Um, You know, we're we're called to love our neighbour. And I'm really sorry about this. It does mean your neighbour. It does mean that very irritating person who's sitting next to you now. (laughs) Um, you know, <laughs> with whom with whom you might disagree on all sorts of things and it's okay to disagree but it's not okay to stop loving one another so, so, so we said earlier what do we see when we look at the world we see division and in the world division usually leads to conflict I want to say this. Let, can't, we, can't we Christians change the story? Yes. That disagreement doesn't need to lead to division. Yeah. Disagreement can lead to a community where we find ways of living with and honouring our disagreements so that everyone can flourish. Now I know that's not going to be possible for everyone on this issue, which is very contentious and very difficult for many of us. You know, and if I'm really honest with you, you know... Yeah, I'll be really honest with you. There's no point in not being honest with you. Yeah, I, I wish it would all go away sometimes. You know, it's not, uh, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. But what the bishops have proposed, and it will be discussed at Synod next week, nothing has yet been decided, what they've proposed is basically four things, which not everyone will agree with, but there's four things. First thing is that the Christian doctrine and understanding of marriage between one man and one woman hasn't changed, doesn't change. But, lesbian and gay people who've entered into a civil marriage, as you know in England since 2013 there's been two sorts of marriage, civil marriage and holy matrimony. People, lesbian and gay people who, who, who are members of our churches by the way, these, aren't, these are already members of our churches, many of our churches will have same sex couples faithfully worshipping with us week after week, those people can, it's possible for them, that's what's being proposed, to come to church, not to be married in church, but to come to church having, having been married in a civil marriage, come to church, and that marriage can be acknowledged, there can be prayers, and the couple could receive a blessing. That, that's what's being proposed. And there's been things I've said which, well, no, there's been things said which have implied it, it's not that. That's what's being proposed. Thirdly, Um, there's a conscience clause, as it were, that that no priest or minister has to offer these prayers. Um, So if you feel, if your conscience says, it's not that I don't want to welcome people, but I don't want to welcome them in that way, that doesn't feel right to me, that's fine. You don't have to do that. Um, But if you do feel it's right, which many, many clergy do, they want to do that to the same-sex couples in their congregation, then you can do it. And the fourth thing is the conversation continues, that we carry on committed to loving one another, to honouring our disagreement, not othering each other, not excluding each other, and we really try hard to maintain the unity of the church. And I believe if we... So I believe this... You know, you need to know I believe these are good proposals. I don't underestimate how difficult it is. There's a lot of people who are saying, why don't you just marry same-sex couples in church? A lot of people saying that. But that isn't what the bishops are proposing. And a lot of people are saying, we shouldn't be making any change at all. I really understand that, but that's not what the bishops are proposing. It is a way that we believe could hold the unity of the church together and take us to a better place. I'm not expecting all of you will agree with me, um, but... I hope you'll understand that's what's being proposed and I really hope you'll pray 
for the General Synod next week because it's a difficult decision. Um, and you'll pray for the unity of the church and you'll pray for our diocese that whatever happens, we will honour our disagreements and live together because I think there's a, there's a bigger thing here. And for me, the bigger thing is if we change the story of division, of disagreement leading to division, if we change the story, then actually what a message that would be to the world. And let me finish. Um, back in John's Gospel, the night before Jesus died, Jesus said to his disciples, by this will all people know that you are my disciples when you agree with one another. No, that isn't what he said. <laughs> he knows what we're like. He knows that we don't agree with one another on many things. No, Jesus said, by this will people know that you're my disciples when you love one another. And that's my great hope and prayer, that, that through this we will love one another. And, and I want you to know that that's my prayer each day. Um, and I, I hope and pray that God will lead us to a good place through this. Thank you so much for this evening. Um, we did say any questions, and you have just bounced around so many different questions. And I suspect that reflects something of your life and ministry, really, that you are bouncing around all these different issues. And so, just as you encourage us to pray for the church and for the synod, you know, I'm sure I speak for all of us saying, you know, we will be praying for you, and we value you as our Archbishop, and we really value all that you bring to us and you give to us. So thank you so much for this evening. I think somebody might be lined up to pray for us as we finish. Here comes Richard. Excellent. Look at the way the Vicar of Emmanuel runs. Wasn't that good? Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, my name's Richard Hare. And to... <laughs> <laughs> to my eternal regret, I have no relation on the Instagram but I am probably, you know, the next best thing, next best job... Is, is being the vicar here, uh, which is a real privilege. Two notices, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll ask the bishop to, Archbishop to bless us. Uh, notice number one is that our chapel at the moment is uh, laid out as a, a room of 24-7 prayer. And if you're visiting us and you haven't had a peek in, do have a peek in before you go. Uh, it is wonderful, and it has been put together by some very creative colleagues. Uh, my job is always to blue tack up the map. <laughs> Second notice, home team only. If you could stay behind for five minutes, the front two rows of chairs need to go back in the chapel and in the narthex, but that's just for our food. Can I pray? And I'd like to pray particularly for Archbishop Stephen. Father, we thank you for the gift that this man is to us and to the wider church. Thank you for his sense of humour. Uh, thank you for his deep knowledge and love of you and his enormous tolerance with us lot. <laughs> Lord, we know that our archbishops, him and, and Justin, get shot at uh, by the press, by people who don't understand, by social media, and by well-meaning Christians as well. So we pray, Lord, not for thicker skins, but for thinner skins and hearts full of love and the resilience that comes from knowing Jesus. Lord, we pray that particularly for, for Justin and Stephen, but also for Bishop Eleanor, for all our bishops and archdeacons and those in positions of leadership. Lord, thank you for granting them to us. Help us to cherish them and encourage them and to love them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Archbishop, if you would bless us, please. Thank you, Richard. So, if you're able to, would you stand? <coughs> And let's just hold a very brief moment of silence as we thank God for whatever we've received from this evening and commit ourselves to living his story in the world.
The Lord be with you. May the Lord go before you to guide you. May he stand behind you and give you strength. May his love watch over you and keep you always in his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. I should have realised it was your name's sake. Well, as I said it.